Amen. Through it all. Name of that song. I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of John, chapter number 3. John, chapter number 3, as we continue through the book of John on Sunday mornings. And uh, John, chapter number 3, when you found your place, if you stand together with me, please, for the reading of God's Word. And John, chapter number 3. And before I read it, uh, let me just remind you, you can go ahead and stand together. Before I read it, you know... Um, I don't know if this has ever happened to you where you, you, you turn on the television or something and you're like, oh, oh I, I, let me watch this. And all of a sudden you realize, I've seen that one before. I don't know about you. If I've seen it before, click. You know, my kids have the ability, some of them, to watch like uh, Isabella will watch the same little movie over and over and over again. My, my little sister, when I was growing up, watched Mary Poppins, I think, a million times. And uh, if, you, if you mention Mary Poppins, it makes me sick. You know, I just, I saw it so much, you know. And so you, you see something like, oh, I've seen that one before. And can I tell you something unique about God's Word? You can look at God's Word over and over and over again, and it's fresh and new every time. Yes, amen. And so I'm going to read this passage, and here's what's going to come to your mind. <laughs> I've heard that one before. Yeah, yeah he's still God. He's still God. I mentioned this last week, and I think it needs to be mentioned again. On that uh, 50th wedding anniversary, when that husband leans over and whispers to his wife, I love you, she's not going to say, I've heard that before. <laughs> she's going to say, it's sweeter every time. Amen. Sweeter every time. John chapter number 3, beginning in verse number 12. The Bible says, if I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not... How shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light cometh into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Lord, I pray that you'd help us as we look at this portion of Scripture. Lord, that you might illuminate to us the truth, Lord. We are, uh, we are not here simply to hear what this man has to say. Lord, my opinion is of no value, Lord, but your word is of eternal value. And so I pray that you would help us to hear. Lord, that if this is the first time, perhaps, that we are being introduced to your love, Lord, may it be exciting and fresh and new. Lord, but if we have known your love for many years, Lord, may it be that much more real and that much more exciting based upon the knowledge we already have. Lord, we thank you for the reality of the fact that you would give to us truth. Lord, we are in need of your truth. No man has truth outside of you. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us, Lord, that we would hear the truth and the truth would set us free. Lord, we thank you so much for all you've done in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As we are picking up in the middle of this story, uh, Nicodemus, the religious man, has come to Jesus by night. And we looked at that last week, how this man of authority, this man of knowledge, uh, the man, this man that had adhered to uh, the religious system, of the day, he was sincere in his practice. He was successful in his uh, implementation of it. He was also considered a man of authority, a ruler of the Jews. Uh, the Bible says he has knowledge and he has ability. And more than that, he has genuineness. And he comes to Jesus by night and he begins by espousing the things that he knows. He says, we know that thou art a man come from God, for no man can do these miracles except the Lord be with him. And Jesus is going to take the next few verses, and we talked about that, uh, about the fact that, listen, what you believe that you know probably came from man, and truth only comes from God. 
He says, we know that thou art a man come from God. And Jesus is going to explain to them, I'm not a man come from God. I'm God come to man. That's a big difference. And so you, we know, and, and he, he's going to continue in this, in this conversation uh, with Nicodemus. And he says, and here's what we know. Look what it says in verse number 11. Verily, verily, I say unto you, we speak what we do know and testify that we have seen and ye receive not our witness. And so Jesus is saying, this is what we know. And so it comes down to a knowledge of who knows right. You ever ask that, somebody asked you that? How, how do you know you're right? How, how do you know that this church is right and, and not that church is right? Everybody thinks they're right. Okay, and that, that, that's a legitimate question. Everybody does think they're right. Here, here's the reality. And I think I can not only prove it biblically, I can prove it personally, I can prove it culturally, I can prove it historically. Here's what is true, here's what we know. Man is false. Man is false. You say, well, I, I've seen religion. Yeah, you've seen implementation of man being false. I've seen men rise to power. Guess what happens? They're false. I, I, I've seen, you say, preacher, how dare you claim everybody else's false? You want to know the reason I know men are false? I are one. In my heart, I know the reality that I would seek my own first. I would seek self first. And man is false. And if man is false, and there is an opposite to that, which there must be an opposite to, to clearly define what is false, God is truth. Man is false and God is truth. And, and therefore, when you, when you think about the systems of man and, and Nicodemus coming up and saying, we know. And Jesus said, listen, you, you may think you know, you may say you know, but the truth, the reality is you don't know I will tell you what I know. You say, well, what qualifies him to know? What qualifies him to be right as opposed to me? Well, look what he says in verse uh, number 12. He says, he says, I have told you earthly things. Remember the difference between natural birth and spiritual birth? We looked at last week. I've told you earthly things. I've explained salvation by birth. I've explained the Holy Spirit by the wind. He said, I've used earthly things to explain to you. He says, uh, I've told you earthly things and you believe not. How shall ye believe if I were to tell you heavenly things? How, how, how am I going to tell you heavenly things if you don't even believe the earthly things, things that you've experienced? And here's why we know that man cannot conjure up. He is, does not have the intellect to understand heaven. He does not have the intellect to understand the spiritual things. He does not have the, the, uh, the capacity to know God beyond God revealing himself. Jesus explains in verse number 13. And no man hath ascended up to heaven. No man hath ascended up to heaven. Now this is very basic. In order for you to know something, in order for you to explain something, you must first have knowledge of it. Uh, that was deep. I know that was really deep. In order for you to know something or explain something, you must first have knowledge of it. And I've used this illustration before, and I, it, I like it. I'm going to use it again. When my wife, when she, went into college, when she was in college, she went to the Grand Canyon and spent a week camping at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. And, and uh, she, they climbed in, they climbed out, they did all sorts of stuff. And she came back, and man, she was telling me how great the Grand Canyon was, how awesome it was, how incredible it was. And uh, she started to show me pictures of it. And I'm flipping through the photo album of the picture going, wow, mm-hmm, that's cool. You know how big the Grand Canyon was for me? Five by seven. That's it. It was five by seven. She's like, oh, man, it was awesome. I was looking over the edge. It was, I took my breath away. I'm like, not mine. There was no depth to it. There was no three-dimensional aspect of it. I, had, I have no knowledge. Somebody's told me about the Grand Canyon. I've even seen pictures. But if I came to you and tried to explain to you how awesome the Grand Canyon was, and you, you said, have you been there? No. But we know it's awesome. Listen, you know who needs to tell you about how awesome the Grand Canyon is? Somebody who's been there. So, and this, again, this is an earthly example. Jesus said, no man hath ascended unto heaven. 
How can you as men believe that you can come up with systems and methods in religion that tell you how to get to some place you've never been? That is, that's, that's ridiculous. I remember years ago, I'm going to get in trouble for this one. Years ago, I was, I was young. I was an idiot. I was working in downtown Tampa. And uh, I was normally worked over uh, valet parking at the, at the Strauss Center, at the Performing Arts Center. Well, they had asked us to go over to the convention center. And so I'm valet parking there at the big convention center. And I was less familiar with that area of downtown. And folks were coming out, and it was, a, it was a teacher's convention, and they were coming out. I'm just going to be honest, they didn't tip very well, so I wasn't, I wasn't very happy. And, and uh, so they come out, and they give me like a dollar tip, and then they ask for directions. <laughs> they said, do you know where this restaurant is? <laughs> well, yes, I do. <laughs> I said, you're going to go over here, and you're going to take a right. And then there's a bridge, and then you're going to take a left, and then you're going to go over here. And I gave them directions, and they drove away, and the guy next to me says, you have no idea what you just told them, do you? I said, I've never been there before in a day of my life. I have no clue. He said, how did you, why did you do that? I, said, I don't know, that sounded good. It sounded like good directions. He said, that was, I've asked God to forgive me. And if they ever come back, I'll ask them to forgive me. They're probably still looking for the restaurant. <laughs> and, here's, and here's what he said, man, you sounded like you knew what you were talking about. You sounded like you, you knew what you were talking about. And they're going, uh-huh, uh-huh, did you get that, honey? Uh-huh. Listen, it doesn't matter what you sound like. It doesn't matter how convincing you are. No man can tell you how to get to heaven because they've never been to heaven. There had to be somebody that came from heaven who would tell us how to get to heaven. And Jesus says, no man has ascended unto heaven. What, what are you espousing all the things that you know? Why are you talking about all the religion that you have? Man is false. Man cannot tell you truth. Only God can reveal truth. Amen. Now, what's interesting, when Jesus said, he didn't say, I know. He said, we know. Because God does not keep his truth exclusive to himself. He likes to share it with other people. That's why we have to believe in God's word and trust God's word. And he says this, no man has descended unto heaven in verse number 13, but he that came down from heaven, even the son of man, which is in heaven. That's why it's so very important to understand the distinction between what Nicodemus said and what Jesus said. Nicodemus said, we know thou art a teacher come from God, which means that he was just another man with another teaching, with another message. He was just more impressive than everybody else. That's not what Jesus is. Jesus was not just another man, another teacher that was more successful than anybody else. He was God, very God, that came down to the earth as man to man to declare the truth of God to men. Amen. And that's the big difference. No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that which is in heaven came down. So he could give knowledge. You can listen, you can hear the knowledge of Christ. You can hear the knowledge of, of heaven and of the truth from Jesus, he's from heaven. He's from heaven. The Bible says this in verse number 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. For what purpose? We'll talk about that story, but for what purpose? That's whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. See, we have no man hath ascended unto heaven. And let me just tell you, uh, without truth, no man will ever ascend into heaven. No man will ever get to heaven based upon his guess, his hope, his intellect, his religion, his activity. No man can ascend into heaven. If a man was good enough to get himself to heaven, he would have already gotten himself there. And Jesus came from heaven. What does he come from heaven with? He comes from heaven with knowledge and truth. For what purpose? To bridge the gap that no man can cover. No man has ascended up to heaven. No man will ascend up to heaven. But Jesus came from heaven so that man, based upon the knowledge of truth, could ascend to heaven. If Jesus came down with simply knowledge and without the ability to transfer that knowledge or transfer the ability to man, can I tell you what that would have been? That would have been cruel. Jesus, I came from heaven. I just came down to let you know you can't go. <laughs> that would not be nice. That would, I do that to my kids sometimes. Okay? 
yeah, <clears throat> we're going out to eat. You can't go. <laughs> Why not? There's a lot of you. <laughs> There's a lot of you. And so here's some Little Caesars pizza. You can't go. They're like, oh, Dad, that's so cruel. Where are you going? Bonefish Grill. <laughs> and Truman's like, man, that's my favorite place. Yeah. One day you grow up, you take your wife there. Okay. <laughs> Dad, this, at that point, to be honest, I'm not overly concerned about their opinion. I'm going to Bonefish Grill. <laughs> it's awesome. But Jesus didn't come down to say, I'm from heaven and you can't go. He came down to transfer the knowledge and ability, the truth of how to go to heaven, the cruel ones, the, those that would be cruel, that would be vicious, that would be mean, is those that have not been there and do not have the knowledge of the truth and are not just simply sharing the knowledge of the one that has been there who are telling you you can go some other way than the way that he said you could go. And in our society, we, we are so concerned about, about uh, everybody feeling right that we're willing to accept that which is untruth as long as we feel good about it. It would be like going to a hospital and there being a, an epidemic, uh, some, some disease that has been spread quickly, and, and, and there is a cure. There is a cure. And, and some man said, I, I had the disease, and, and I've overcome the disease, and, and I can give you the cure. And he invites people to come into the hospital room where they can give the inoculation, they can give the, the antidote, the cure, and they begin to invite him in, and other rooms in the hospital open, and other doctors that have not the cure, but they want to experiment and see which will work, and they invite them in as well. Well, let's be kind to those doctors, and, and as long as you're sincere, any room you go into would be okay. Uh, to be honest, only one room would be good. The room with the truth. That's the only room that would be valid. And we have so many that, that would be upset if you were to say that only Jesus has the knowledge of truth and beyond the knowledge, Jesus is the only way of truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Well, that's just, not, that's just not culturally acceptable nowadays to say that Jesus is the only way. It doesn't matter if it's culturally acceptable. It is true. Amen. And the truth is exclusive. Truth is not based on variable. Truth is not relative. Truth is exclusive. It is there's only one way. And it would be cruel to say that there was another way. Well, why is your way better? I know the guy that's been there. I'm not, coming, I'm not making up my own way. I'm just telling you the guy, I'm telling you about the one who came from there. If you're going to believe anybody, you should probably believe somebody that was from there. Jesus came down from heaven so that he might give the truth, so that he might be lifted up, so that the way, the truth, the life could be given unto all men. Amen. What is the way? We have to ask this question first. Why is it that man does not have the ability? Why is it that man does not have the ability to get themselves to heaven? Why is it that, that man does not have the ability to intellectually, spiritually, an uh, uh, activity ascend to that place? Look what it says in verse, in verse number uh, 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You see, some would say Jesus came down. Jesus didn't come down to tell us we were wrong. That's not what it says. He didn't tell, here's what he said in, in the context of what we're talking about. He didn't come down to say, ha ha, you can't go. I just came down to let you know you can't. He didn't come down to say, I'm from heaven. You can't go. And I'm just here to let you know you can't go. Have a nice trip. See you later. That would be declaring condemnation. But the fact that he gives us a way doesn't mean that that infers by any means that we are worthy of going or had the ability to go without his way. We were lost, we were hopeless, we were undone. Until he came, we were already in condemnation. We already could not go. He doesn't come down to confirm our condemnation. He comes down to deliver us from condemnation. Amen. Look what it says in verse number 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. He that believeth on him has found the way. He has access now. But he that believeth not is condemned already. 
Why is he con condemned? Because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. It's interesting, Jesus didn't come down to make sure you couldn't go to heaven. Jesus didn't come down and say, oh man, I better get down there because they're going to find a way and I got to go down there and stop them. He didn't come down to contem condemn them. He came down to say, you're already condemned. You're already condemned. Years ago, when I was about five years old, I went to, my parents took me to uh, some sort of shopping place and my mom was shopping. And uh, I don't know if you've ever been five years old out with a mom shopping, you got to do something. And so you like hide inside the, you know, they make those little cl clothing things. You hide inside the clothing things and mom's oblivious because she's shopping. And pretty soon she's over there and you pop out of the clothing thing, surprise her, and mommy is gone. And you're like, now what do I do? And so I started looking around for mom and little did I know that my parents thought somebody else had me and so they were like over to the next door. And so I'm looking around for him, can't find him, can't find him. And eventually my parents figured out that I wasn't with them. They came back to the store and they went up to the counter and they said, would you mind announcing over uh, the speaker system we want to find our child? Now can you imagine this? <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, Richard Rossiter, we just want to let you know you're lost. Have a good day. That's not the purpose for the announcement. The purpose is, friend, I know I'm lost. If I don't know I'm lost, I need some help. I was the one, where's my mommy? It would be cruel to go, just want to let you know, you're lost. Your parents are gone. You have no way. You're condemned. That would be a cruel announcement. We're going to have to try that one time. You know what the purpose of the announcement is? You're lost, but your parents are waiting at the front. There's a way. The purpose of the announcement is not to simply leave you condemned, to leave you lost. Friend, any person that understands life, any person that understands self knows that in their own heart they have sin, they have, uh, they have, they're wayward, they seek their own, they have no knowledge of God. The purpose of the announcement is not to condemn it is to bring freedom from condemnation. All men are condemned. All men are false. All men are born lost. We talked about that last week. They're born flesh, produce flesh. There is no spirit. There is no life. The announcement is we have found a way. Now, in order for it to be correct, the way must be true. The way must be true. And I, I don't know about you, but it would be a cruel. It would be cruel for that little child in the store who is lost for the announcement to come up and say, your parents are in the front. And I, I worked at Walmart for a while. We used to have fun with the intercom system. You could just push that, and I could just see myself when I hear that announcement. Uh, please come to your front if you're looking for your party. I, please come to electronics if you're looking for your party. Uh, please come to sewing if you're looking for your party. Man, which one? Can I tell you, they can only be in one place? And only one of those is true? And who are you going to believe on how to have faith? Who are you going to believe on what is eternal life? Who are you going to believe about life after death? I know who I believe. I'll believe some scientist. Can I tell you, he's never been dead. I, I tell you who I believe. I believe some psychologist. He's never been to heaven. I tell you what I believe. I believe some preacher. I believe some priest. They've never been to heaven. You know who you need to believe? The one who came from heaven. Amen. That's who you need to believe. And Jesus Christ came from heaven so that he might show the way. So what? all men need the way. They're condemned because of their sin. Here's the reality. It tells us this in verse number 20. For everyone that doeth, um, for verse number 19. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because... Their deeds were evil. There is a, a philosophy that is being espoused today that men in their nature are basically good. I tell those people they've never had children. <laughs> children are not born basically good. They're born little liars and thieves. I never had to teach one of them how to lie. Never had to teach one of them how to Steal. I never had to teach one of them when I said, are you talking? What is their first response? Nope. 
And if you get a reaction, the natural reaction is that which is self-preserving, not truth. Did you hit him? No. I saw you hit him. Your eyes must be bad. <laughs> men are born, basically, men are born broken because of sin. Sin was passed down. We're born broken because of sin. And they're the evil, how, what do we do with our sin? How can we overcome our sin? Jesus Christ comes. So if we know he brings the way, we know we need the way because of our own condemnation, our own sin. What is the way? Verse number 15, for whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. Then we get to the verse in verse number 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. See, this is what God did when we understand the idea of the love of God. God understood because of sin came into the world, Romans chapter 5 and verse number 12, because sin came into the world, death by sin, and death is passed upon all men, for all have sinned. And so God saw and realized and knew that, that, that man had sinned and man was lost and man was condemned and man had no ability to redeem or restore himself. And God loved him. God loved him. In order to display and show his love, he sent his son. For what purpose? To die in their place. To bear their punishment. To pay for their sin. To provide means and way of outside of their condemnation. So they, not, they do not have the ability to earn everlasting life. So he sent God to pay for the sin, to bridge the gap so that he might give everlasting life. He said, I, I think I can earn it. Friend, you can't earn it. You cannot earn it. I was reading about a preacher who told the story. He said, can you imagine if you were to be able to understand the love of God? And so you went and asked every person, what, what is the love of God meant? And they would try to explain it to you. And God gave you the ability to go into the very heavens. And you would just search the very heavens. And you'd find the angel Gabriel who understands uh, God and has seen God. And you say, Gabriel, could you please explain to me the love of God? This is what Gabriel would say. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. This is the display of God's love. It is, it's, it's not arrogance, it is foolishness to believe that God is attainable outside of his love. It is foolishness to believe that God will accept those that have rejected his love. I did, uh, yet we were in Seattle yesterday. Wow. We were in Seattle and did a wedding, the David George's wedding on Friday night. And they come down the aisle and David meets Abigail and I'm doing the wedding here and they're exchanging a vows of love. Can you imagine being at a wedding where the groom says, um, I don't love you. And... I'll probably date others, but I think it'd be beneficial for us to be married. So let's go ahead and do this thing. And the bride says, oh, yippee. <laughs> and the bride says, no. And everybody in the crowd goes, oh, well, that wasn't nice of her. She should really love him anyway. Can I tell you, she probably does. But there needs to be a reception of love. It needs to be received. God already loved the world. God already loves the world. But in order for his love to bridge the, bridge the gap of their condemnation, in order for his love to be effective in the, in the sacrifice of the person of Jesus Christ, his love must be received. His love must be believed. His love must be accepted for it to be effective and work in our heart and work in our life. He already loves you. He already sent Christ for you. Christ already died for you. The sin payment has already been made. All that is left to be done is for it to be received and accepted. 
And when it's believed and accepted and understand, I can't do it, I'm guilty, I'm condemned, I'm hopeless, but you love me, you sent your son for me, I accept him as my savior, I put my faith and trust in him. Jesus says, based upon that belief, you have everlasting life. Amen. Something cool about the English language here, he didn't say you'll get everlasting life. He didn't say when you die, you'll get everlasting life. No, he says you have everlasting life. Friend, I know Jesus Christ is my savior. I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I already have everlasting life. You say, well, but, but I think, aren't, aren't you gonna die? Physically, this body's gonna die, but I will forever have life. The definition of death, and you can scientific definition, whatever, the definition of death is simply separation. I'm gonna go through physical death, separation from my body but I will never go through spiritual death, separation from God. I have everlasting life. And physical death is a necessary thing, because I don't know if you know this, these bodies aren't getting any younger, <laughs> right? I just had a birthday and these bodies are not getting any younger. People used to say, oh, what a nice young pastor. They don't say that anymore. <laughs> like, wow kind of getting up there. Our knees hurt and life, goes all, even, even the decay of the body is a result of sin. Listen, it's not a bad thing that eventually one day we'll shed these bodies because he has something better for us. Amen. Well, preacher, I just don't know if I believe you. That's okay. You don't have to believe me. Believe the one that came from heaven. Believe the one that came from heaven. The word of God makes it pretty clear that if we shall call upon the name of the Lord, we shall be saved. For the heart man believeth, and with the mouth confession is made unto righteousness. And we have to put our faith and trust in Christ. And if you're trying to figure out who you believe, which church, which religion, listen, throw out of the side and just ask you, are you going to believe man? Or are you going to believe God? Because here's what I know about man. Man is false. But God is true. You say, preacher, you're telling us from the Bible, didn't man write the Bible? God did use men to write the Bible. And aren't men false? You bet they are. Aren't you glad God intervened? And he inspired them and he moved them to write his words. If men wrote the Bible without God's help, the Bible would be just as false as any other book. But God makes it clear that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable because it's true. So the question comes down to who do you believe? You really have this choice. You can believe your own intellect. You can believe your own knowledge about heaven or some other man's knowledge about heaven. All of which have not been there and have no idea how to get there. Or you can believe God. Yeah, but I don't like it. God says I'm condemned. He just tells you the truth. But he didn't come to condemn you. He came to give you eternal life, to overcome your condemnation by lifting up Jesus Christ. Close with this verse in verse number 14. It says this, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Some stories from the book of Numbers. And the children of Israel had disobeyed God. And God sent those serpents in and, and bit them. And, and uh, they, were, they, were, they were dying. And they cried out to God, we have sinned. What, what, what do we do? And God told Moses to make a brazen serpent and lift it up. And those that looked to the serpent would be healed. Those that looked to the, the brazen serpent that had been lifted up would be healed. That would be the, the solution. They would look to God and look and trust God. And he uses it as an illustration that says people are still dying. People are still dying in their sin. And don't listen to some uh, preacher that doesn't believe the, the Bible that tells you if you die in your sin, you don't go to a place called hell. You just stop your existence. The Bible teaches that those that are condemned are condemned to eternal punishment. And so he says, lift up Jesus. Lift up the one who came from heaven that can give the truth on how to be freed from condemnation and get to heaven. What's so special about heaven? I'll tell you what's special about heaven. God's there. Amen. God's there. 
Uh, I know there's going to be mansions and streets of gold. But that's not what makes heaven special. God's there. And forever we shall be with the Lord. Let me give you this. Take your Bibles and turn to John, 6, uh, John 14. I just want to read this passage to you. Let the scripture speak for yourself. Speak for itself. John chapter 14 and verse number 1. This explains the message. We don't know the way. God knows the way. John chapter 14, verse number 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me, Jesus says. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, in the way ye know. Thomas said, he speaks for all men. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. How can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Amen. Jesus, I've come from heaven, going back to heaven to prepare a place for you. And if I'm there, you'll be there. If you believe in me, Thomas said, I, I don't know the way. How am I supposed to get there? Man, what an honest guy. An honest guy. He said, I don't know how to do it. He said, Jesus says, I'm the way. He didn't say you'll figure out the way. He didn't say you can become the way. No, you can't. You're false. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Well, how do I allow you to take me to the Father? Believe on me. I am God. I've come to this earth to pay for your sins. I died upon the cross so that you might have forgiveness. But I rose again to show you that I had victory over death, hell, and the grave. Put your faith in me as the way. Put your faith in me. I'll give you this illustration. We'll be done. I was, we were driving, oh, this was um, down to South Tampa. Have you ever driven in South Tampa? God bless you. I was driving to South Tampa and going to, uh, to some folks' house, and we were following the GPS. And uh, here we go. We're following the GPS. We're driving down South Del Mabry. You know, the, the roads are about this wide, you know. And, and I'm just watching for cars. I'm just trying to survive, you know, driving down Del Mabry by McDill. And, and, but I don't have to worry about where I'm going. All I have to worry about is making sure I don't get stuck and get hit. or so Because the GPS is telling me the way. GPS is, uh, at 100 feet, turn right. Hey, I can do that, man. Just tell me the way. And I'm going the way. All of a sudden, we get, you have arrived at your destination. We're going to somebody's house, but we weren't at somebody's house. We were at a large warehouse. I'm thinking, I don't think this is the destination. And so we're like, what happened? Something wrong with the GPS? You know, we always blame the GPS, you know? Something wrong with the GPS? What's the matter with this GPS? You know these things never work, you know. You know what happened? We inverted two numbers of the address. I say we. We inverted two numbers of the address. And because we had not put in the right information, it didn't take us to the right place. We had to change the, the information to make sure that we were going to the right place. Listen, it's very important that as you are going to make your way along, you must trust the right information. And only truth comes from God, and he has delivered his truth to mankind through his word. And his word says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I asked you the same question that I asked you last week. Have you been born of the Spirit? Are you a child of God? Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your means and hope of salvation and eternal life? If you have not, you're just another religious traveler going in circles. You may strive, you may go, you may end up somewhere, but it will not be the destination of heaven. 
you must be born again. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'd help us today. Lord, that there are perhaps some that have been striving. They are religious in nature and makeup and They've been active in trying to fix their life and adhere to a system. But if they were to be honest, there was not a place, a point in time when they put their faith and trust in Christ, when they turned from their sins and asked Christ to forgive them and accepted his death, burial, and resurrection as their payment for their sin and their hope of salvation. Lord, maybe there would be some here today that if they're honest, whether they are religious or not religious, whether they have been in deems of society, have been good, or whether they have been uh, what would, some would consider bad, or none of those things, none of those things produce birth in Christ. None of those things produce life. Only Christ. And Lord, maybe they have not come to Christ and received the love of God and put their faith and trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as their hope and means of salvation. Lord, maybe today they would come. Let somebody take the Bible and show them how they can know for certain that heaven is their home, their sins have been forgiven, and you are their God. Lord, maybe there are Christians here today, and to be honest, though they know you as Savior, That sweet fellowship of love has been lost because other things have been garnering their attention. Lord, may you remind them of that wedding day, of that birthday, when they put their faith and trust in you. And may it grow sweeter. And Lord, may we, out of our love for you, return that love to you because you first loved us and serve you and honor you as our Lord, as our King as our Savior.